So episode 27 of uh, Let's Grab Coffee. This was uh, this was honestly one that I was very excited for. How do you even reach someone like Michael? And how do you even you know get him on a podcast like Let's Grab Coffee? I think one of the most underutilized tools is a platform like LinkedIn. So all it really took was just shooting him a message and saying, Hey Michael, how's it going? Uh, my name is George. I have this podcast I've been actually running for over a year now. It's called Let's Grab Coffee. I have 26 episodes. Um, I've had people from actors, from athletes, from TEDx speakers, from motivational coaches, from behavioral experts, all kinds, and would love to have you just to talk about your story, right, as an entrepreneur. Uh, super relatable. Uh, I made points after I actually researched his profile. It's not like I just cold, uh, cold emailed with a, you know, with a generic template. Uh, so I think a lot of you out there, you know, you're kind of intimidated you know, or you're, you're hesitant, right? You don't want to use LinkedIn or you're afraid of rejection, right? Or um, if you send a message or an email, you're afraid of a no response. I always say there's three outcomes. If you reach out to someone, there's always three outcomes. Either they say yes, they say no, or they don't reply, right? So you have you have one out of three. One out of three outcome for success or for a yes. And that's, and that's really all you need. And sometimes it's just that one break um, that really creates that momentum or that traction for you. And so if there's one message before we get to Michael's office is start now, don't make excuses. Utilize those platforms that you have and make the best of every opportunity because you're the one creating it. So stop waiting for things to happen for you. <laughs> What's going on everybody? This is George Gliefe and it's episode 27 of Let's Grab Coffee. This is a pretty special episode because we have Michael Hyatt, a very special guest who's a very well-known and successful Canadian entrepreneur with two large exits valued around 400, 500 million uh, dollars. So Michael is also an investor and a mentor. Uh, he's part of the Creative Destruction Lab as well as the Founder Institute. Uh, Michael has invested through the top hit um, podcast called The Pitch. So you'll see him as a regular on CBC. Uh, and Michael also runs his family office both in Yorkville and Toronto. A lot of great insights from, from Michael and I'm really looking forward to uh, doing this podcast with you. Sure, thanks for having me. Thanks, man. So uh, first of all, tell us how you're doing. What are you up to? What's top of line for Michael? I'm pretty busy. So we started a family office last year uh, here in Yorkville and Toronto. So we've we're in the more in the business now of after ex exiting the companies of investing. Mm -hmm. So uh, investing is the most beautifully simple and the most complex thing I've ever done. It uh, you know it's a, you spend a lot of time looking at stuff and a lot of time saying no and and waiting. Um, investing I've learned is a lot about doing nothing, and a lot about don't invest in things you just don't understand. Dance with who you brought. Stick into industries that make sense to you. And if it sounds complicated, don't. And so I've done a lot of nothing because I'm just trying to understand how it all works. And uh, I'm on a bit of a, a learning curve because now that's what I'm doing. And you find that obviously you've, you've built two very successful tech companies with your brother. Um, do you find that a lot of those learnings now you're taking and finding them uh, in, in the investing side? So part of what we do is invest in other entrepreneurs and other startups, and uh, what we learned in that process, we certainly apply in our investing. Sure. Uh, we look for just uh, entrepreneurs that we really like and really believe in. Our, our idea is that the earlier the company is, the more you have to bet on the pivot, meaning that we think that when we bet on these entrepreneurs early, they will all pivot. We're just betting on their ability to do that pivot. Okay, and how early are you investing? Like, what, What's the check size? You know, our check size will be as small as just, you know, putting our toe in the water at 25,000 all the way up to half a million um, or more. It just depends on uh, what the deal is and how invested we are or do we want to become, like, if it's just we put in some money and we don't do anything, that's one thing, is if we're putting in money and we're joining the board and we're getting involved, that's another. The expensive thing for us is not the money. The expensive part for us is the time. The time, yeah. the, time the effort, which is more strategic capital as well like yeah. on, on the company's behalf. That's right. And, and obviously within tech, there's so many verticals. Are you focused, because you, I think you've been mainly on the software side, are you still SaaS software? Or what, no, guys? no, we, um, through the Creative Destruction Lab, which has really opened uh, up my universe of investments, uh, we see um, a lot of really great things in, uh, in uh, uh, artificial intelligence, in quantum computing, in you know, just, just a lot of areas of security, mm -hmm. uh, medical devices. Uh, uh, or just medical, uh, like a lot, kind of you see a lot of very cool firms that are doing medical with artificial intelligence and yeah. genetics. And so we're seeing a lot of very, very interesting companies. I mean, there is something very special happening in Toronto right now. And, you know, I think every city thinks they're special, and I think in one way they are, but Toronto has, I think, a very, very real lead in artificial intelligence right now. Uh, and they're doing really, really well, especially around 
you know, around the UFT campus and the professors that are there. Of course, I mean, obviously, like on top of that, it's also Montreal, right? With, with yeah, I know they're doing fantastic as well. But Canada, Canada's doing great on a world general. stage. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting about your story, just talking about uh, geography, right? I mean, you started in the early 2000s as well. And did you ever have that sort of recollection to say, you know what, if I, if I am to succeed, if I am to raise a certain uh, amount of, uh, you know, capital through fundraising, I have to be in Silicon? Or, and, and if you didn't have that sort of mindset, what was it for you that enabled you to be successful in Toronto early on? Because now we're talking about the tech you, but... you know, there's, a, there's this great, there's this, this epic battle always when you start a company, and if you really want to be great and you really want to be big, you got to go to the valley. Yeah. And I've always felt, I've been very filled to worlds. When I go to the valley, mm -hmm. I have more great meetings in one week than I could have in six months in Toronto. There is just amazing talent and, connect, and connections there. But you don't have to be in the valley. You can go to the valley, but you don't have to be there. The upside to the valley is that they're very bleeding edge. They're very advanced. Um, they understand business models. They, they know how to put companies together. There's a velocity to it. There's a lot of money. Um, there's people who deeply understand technology and how to invest and how to move a company. On the downside, you will pay sometimes three times more for an engineer to code. Um, people move around every, I don't know, nine months, so their turnover is very high in your company. It's hard to get salespeople, hard to get engineers. They're very expensive, so you have to raise a lot of capital. Um, so I think if you can build a company on the East Coast, you're gonna pay a lot less, and if you can visit the Valley and, and get involved there, I think you're gonna do okay. Hmm. Well, it's, I always bring up this example too, but Skip the Dishes was started in Winnipeg, yeah. right? I mean, Shopify, great example, Ottawa. Right? Yeah. They, these are not necessarily the biggest tech hubs that you come to think, but I mean, they, they, giants are being built out of these, these areas, right? I think in the future, location won't matter as much. Right. Um, but then again, you know, I also, I also hear this debate that we can replicate the valley. Well, we can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe China could catch up in a way, a whole nation, but... You know, just to be clear, Silicon Valley's had a 40-year head start on Toronto and everywhere else in a very meaningful way. And it's literally part of their ethos, they're part of their, 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 uh, their genetics there. Um, there is no reason you can't build a great company in Winnipeg or anywhere, in Lethbridge, Alberta, anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, there is no reason with the connectivity and the cloud we have and the ability to you know, connect with people remotely, we can't uh, build a great company anywhere. Uh, Toronto just is just becoming more and more concentrated and much more uh, popular place to be. And so when you're looking to invest, right, I mean, do you have a proximity yourself? Like, is it just Canada? Is it U.S.? Are you, are you constantly getting Yeah, it's, it's Canada and the U.S. I think it's a little harder to get to Europe yeah. um, or, or other places. Opinion? Well, I think there's a time difference and you gotta be there. I think you've gotta have a certain rhythm and a certain connectivity with the entrepreneurs you invest in. I mean, look, to be clear in our family office, we spend most of our money buying, you know, real estate and private equity and stocks and sure. big boring things that really wouldn't <laughs> impress you. But some of our money goes into venture capital and some of that money goes into um, uh, these, these smaller companies. Mm -hmm. We also, my brother and I sit on the advisory board of Georgian Partners in Toronto, I think, I, I, th I feel the best venture capitalist in the country, and they've done phenomenal investing, so we invest alongside them a lot. Um, and then the sub part of our investments are going directly, like you see on the show, The Pitch, or yeah. Creative Destruction Lab, or people that approach us. And um, you know, it all comes down to, do, do we like the founders, do we like the market? But there's no, there's no specific thing, one thing that we look for. What you look for. Mm -hmm. When you say, do we like the founder, that's always, is, uh, I think particularly important, especially for very early stage investments. I mean, you're you're always looking at the management team, right? Do they vibe? Uh, you have a really good saying. I was watching one of your YouTube clips that says, "Hire your weakness," mm -hmm. uh, right? Especially when you look at that that sort of team combination, the synergies. What do you look for qualitatively, quantitatively, when you're actually looking at a team? You're assessing their their worthiness to invest. Well, I think that um, I, I think I can speak for most investors when they say the first thing they do when they see a, an entrepreneur with a company is they think right away, can I work with this individual? Can I? Are they coachable? Will they listen to me? Or when I say something, do they just kind of ignore it and say, yeah, 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 I heard you. But because soon as the word "but" comes in, everything before it just you can erase it, right? They heard you, but they're not listening to you, and that's very common. But Sometimes you find some really great individuals who are uh, really there to listen to you, can take guidance and take shaping, and hopefully you can take them off the back streets and onto the highway and get them to their goal faster. All, all great investors can do for you as an entrepreneur is make sure that you make less mistakes. 
Uh, one of the reasons we're successful is that we made a lot of mistakes, but we made less mistakes than other people mm. because we would listen and we're a bit humble on the path knowing what we don't know. I think people in general should only work on their strengths and hire their weaknesses. So if you're a really, really great marketer and you're not a tech person, get a partner who's a tech person. If you're a really great tech person and can't sell, partner with a salesperson and don't try to do their job. Like if you're great in sales, don't try to understand coding. I mean, yeah. that's not gonna happen and that's not efficient use of your time. I also see a lot of entrepreneurs that start building companies and start getting some success at 10, 20, 30, 40 people. Mm -hmm. And they end up getting bogged down in operations uh, into things that are like, for example, uh, benefits plans and all this kind of stuff and hire. But now hiring is really important, but a lot of operational things in the company like, I don't know, should we have a lunch policy? Should this and that? Those are important, but not really. Like what's important is that they, 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 they spend so much time on internals as they come super up. Micro. They, yeah, super micro. They, they don't step back from the business and actually do the things that, that really are valuable, like sell. Like, the way you have to look at yourself as CEO, you're worth 10,000 bucks an hour, maybe more. So every, every hour you spend on things that aren't selling and moving your company forward on revenue, you're, you know, you're burning it. I like that. That's a, that's a very good analogy. I think, Michael, you, you, you know, I guess you'll resonate with this as well, but um, a lot of founders start off you know, saying, say, for example, there's a software engineer right, or a computer engineer. They come up with a name. right? They come up with a business. They form the team. And they're, they're therefore very, very tied or very emotional to the business. And there's always ego right, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. Right? I'm sure this is... Part of the game, part of being successful too. So, for someone watching, like, how do you how do you let go of that that ego and and look for other people to kind of complement your skills? How did you do that early on? Like, what was or how did you even you know come to that self awareness where you know exactly what you're good at and exactly what, where you need uh, help to fill those gaps? Look, uh, I I have a I have an ego. I have a strong ego, um, and that's not a bad thing. I think you have to be confident to be an entrepreneur, but. If you really want to make money as an entrepreneur, you need to get really great people to help you make money. And you need to step back from the table and let other people help you and magnify what you're trying to do. Um, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that don't allow uh, space for other A players in their company to actually do really well. You know, people say, well, how did you know Google and Facebook and these companies do so well? And all you see in Google is the you know, two founders or, or Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook and, and Microsoft, you saw Bill Gates and all this. But truthfully, that's a very small part of the story, yeah. right? And, and if you start getting behind Zuckerberg, for example, at Facebook, you start seeing Sheryl Sandberg, then you see a whole lineup. What you're seeing is a massive lineup of talented people. Right. Look at Shopify in Canada. You know, you see you know, remarkably talented executives there, and Toby and Harley and, and everybody. But behind them are very, very talented people that they spend a lot of time hiring. Uh, very, very talented people, and they let A players be A players, and they let them expand. So the, one of the reasons a company does so well is that you hire A players, and then you let them do their job, and you don't get your ego involved, and you let them make decisions. I always say that if you can't make the decision, let the person under you make the decision. You know, you've got to you've got to have people who, in your company who act as if they're the CEO. They take ownership of something. So if someone's running marketing, they literally have to act as the CEO of marketing and take complete ownership. If they're waiting for guidance all the time, it's probably not a good thing. Mm. So I think what I'm also hearing is, is a lot of proactiveness, right? A lot of taking initiative, uh, being a leader yourself, and, and hiring for for both companies. What was that sort of leadership trait that you always wanted to see with people you were hiring? Low management, high productivity. Okay. So I didn't want to be in the business of managing people. I wanted to be in the business of hiring amazing people who do the right things um, when I'm not there. I mean, look, every company has, it's organic, it has an ethos, it has a living thing. Every company, whether you like it or not, has a union. Mm. Whether you have one or not, you have one. And a fish rots from the head. So whatever tone the CEO or the founder sets, that will be pervasive through your company. Uh, and, and you need to, the trick to doing really well and making money and scaling is to convince really great people that they're free to make really great decisions and, and debate you and, and push forward. Sometimes you can go to certain companies where they're all terrified of the CEO, so nothing actually ever gets done. They're all kind of waiting for the decision. That's a very expensive problem. You have seven executives on the table all being frozen, not being able to do anything because they're terrified of what the founder or the CEO thinks. It's very unproductive. So, so I guess really setting that culture where you're actually enabling a lot of your senior senior management team to then enable. Yeah, them. let let them own the upside, let them own the downside. Exactly. So yeah, like look, yeah, I mean, but also, you know, you can also be innovative and not let them fail. If some you fail as a team, you fail as a team, and you move on. 
You know, I mean, you can't run a company saying, well, if some marketing guy brings up an idea, it doesn't go well. You don't just fire them. You, you, you work with them. You, you, you kind of accept a, a, an executive responsibility for it, but you, you allow them to try things. Right. You allow them to fail. You allow them to pivot. You allow them to move. That's innovation. How have you handled failure within, within I guess, a business context? I think that what happens is that as you keep score, we kept on going up, we kept on on our companies growing, but we'd always, you know, we'd, you know, win a million, win a two million dollar deal, lose a million dollar deal, you know, like it happens all the time, right? I mean, you know, it's a bit of a stairmaster, and you will lose deals. Like when when I hear companies say our win rate's hundred percent or ninety five percent, that's all untrue. Yeah. There's something very wrong with that when I hear that. I mean, every yeah, everybody loses deals, everybody gets second place, you know. Uh, everybody loses great talent. Sometimes people just leave your company because because they do. Some people just sometimes you're building a company and you know you lose a deal, lose a person. Mm -hmm. You know somebody sues you for something. Like it just happens. That, that that's just normal process of business. So then, how do you stay motivated? I mean, in the face of these failures, what what are some some of the things you do? Whether it's like a, I don't know, like a morning ritual or a daily routine. What keeps you? Yeah, my morning ritual is getting up and going to work and, and driving hard. I didn't have kind of get up, meditate for 10 minutes, I, as mindfulness. I didn't do any of that. Yeah. I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I mean, maybe people get a lot out of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe people enjoy that. Um, I, that was never me. Um, that that whole thing. And. Uh, Put in the ground, like that. It was just a grind and a grit and showing up. And I showed up and I kept showing up and I kept showing up. Like, when you invest in an early stage company, you could be in it for 10 years, maybe 15. You're in it for a long time. Mm -hmm. When people start companies, if they think they're going to sell it to Google in three years, they're, like, they're, there's, a, there's a real recipe for disaster. Like, you, you, you shouldn't be in the business to sell a company. You should be in the business to build something great. Mm -hmm. and, and companies are not, you know, sold, they're bought, you know, for reasons. You know, and uh, we weren't looking to sell Blue Cat. It just kind of happened. Exactly. You know, we, we weren't for sale at all. In fact, we were pretty happy. But, uh, you know, stuff happens. Yeah, well, I remember reading your uh, Beta Kit article, actually. And I think at the bottom is where you talk about that. And, uh, and you say, like, I think the focus for entrepreneurs should be growing the business, not necessarily selling it. And if you focus on growing a business and you're successful at it, then acquirers will actually chase you versus you doing it, right? Yeah, look, I also would tell you that we were, we've were we been profitable at Blue Cat for a long time, and I'm still on the board of Blue Cat, and we're still profitable, doing really well. And, and you know, if you're profitable, then you have all the decision power in the world because you're not diluting, you don't need to do another round. One of the things I see a lot of right now is people will do, like, all these weird rounds. They'll do a pre-seed, then seed, then A, but, like, they'll raise a pre-seed round, and as soon as they close that, about 20 minutes later, they're thinking of higher, raising their next round at some higher valuation. Yeah. And that's only happening for a few reasons. It's happening because they can. That wasn't always true. There's a lot of money sloshing around in the market, and there's a lot of velocity to money right now. Interest rates are still relatively low. Um, so there's this kind of a, an addiction to constantly raising money. Mm -hmm. Like, you got to have your C, then you got to have your pre you know, your pre seed, then you have your C, then you have your A, then you have. Like, um, it, it's this kind of uh, almost fanatic anxiety to constantly raise money. Raise money. Where I've told a lot of entrepreneurs, why don't you just raise your 500 grand or your million and take a step back and see where you are. Like, try not to burn all that money so fast. Just relax a little bit. You don't have to grow that fast. You should, you know, get understanding your metrics, get understanding the levers. Mm -hmm. Like, some companies need more money than that to get going, and data scientists are expensive and all the rest of it. I get that. But there's this constant, you're on this constant, you know, Cycle. Uh, hamster wheel to yeah. constantly raise money where people should know, understand something. When you sell, when you take on a venture capitalist, you take on investors, you are committing to sell your company. Because right. at some point, you're going to give them liquidity. liquidity yeah. So for you, I think, you know, for Blue Cat, uh, you almost raised 30 million, I believe. Uh, we raised something like 30 million US. 30 yeah. Million? Okay. yeah. Um, for a lot of founders on this topic, I mean, it's, it's almost like there's like a romanticizing of, of raising money versus making money. Especially, right. right? Especially with with uh, tech startups, I think they'll resonate with this. And um, but, how do you go from from deciding when you really need to raise money, when you need to back off, when you should be bootstrapped, uh, right? Well, it's look, kind of it's it, it's pretty simple. It's not difficult. It's 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 if you're raising five million, you need to get a return on that money. So if you raise five million and you don't get a successive bump in your revenue, that creates a valuation jump. Right. So, for example, if you if you raise five million and you can't get your revenue up, uh, and it doesn't create another, I don't know, twenty-five million or something in valuation or something like that, or twenty million, like it didn't make sense to do it, 
right? Like if you raise five million and you bump your valuation five or 10 million, like, you know, that's pretty expensive money, right? Yeah. And I think that sometimes you should try to raise two and a half million and take two and a half million in debt maybe. There's a lot of good debt options too. Especially, where you don't have to, especially now. Like, yeah, I mean, there's, big there's you know, big involved. banks are doing it. National banks doing a great job in Toronto now EDC, of it. Espresso. EDC, Silicon Valley Bank's coming in. There's Espresso Capital. They've done a great job. Yeah. I, I'm an investor in there, so I just full disclosure. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. And uh, but listen, there there is places like Espresso you can get money. There's a whole number of them, and uh, uh, there there there's other ways to not dilute. But that money is all good if if you're going to use it to grow significantly. Then that was the best bet. If you raise five million, you don't really get anywhere, which I've seen people do a bunch, or two or three million. Then that was the most expensive money you've ever raised. It's dirt cheap money if you get, if you, if you move your valuation of 20, 30 million, well, it's great. Mm. Right? What was the first thing you did when you, when you raised your first round for Blue Pack? Just went back to work. And I think today what they do is they have a whole rooftop patio party. Mm. And I think that's silly. Popping champagne. And... Yeah, I, they have very expensive parties and I don't understand that. Uh, I don't celebrate selling parts of my company. I celebrate deals and hiring great people, mm. you know, revenue and great people. So when the final sales uh, happened for, for, for your companies, what was the feeling like? Like, what did you, what was your mindset? What did you kind of go through? Was it you bitter? know, was I, it, I, I, I'd like to tell you that I'm still on the board of Blue Cat, so I still right. have shares in Blue Cat. Um, I, I, it didn't, my, my life didn't change at all. I think that people thought it would. Um, I'd go out and buy all these fancy things, and I haven't. Uh, my life has actually stayed very much the same. Um, when it was over, I didn't really... It was a bit of a non-event for me. I, I know that sounds weird, but I just I don't know, got up and went to the gym the next day and went back to work, you know, and made a family office and got into something else. I didn't... You were never in it for the money, really? I mean, um, more so than no, money. no, I'll be very clear about that. I, I was in it for the money. I, 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 I believe making money is a great way of keeping score. I, I absolutely do like making money. There is no doubt I, you know, in the money I've made compounds and it makes money and I and I get up every day I make money through real estate and private equity and all these different diverse things that I do and dividends that is something that's great because mm. when you make a lot of money it just compounds and it's a bit unstoppable it gives you freedom too to do it gives you complete freedom the only thing that money does it just allows you to use your time where you want so the question is are you using your time well and what do you really want to do um, so I would be am I motivated by money yeah, cer certainly I, I started my companies because I wanted to make money. Right. There was no, no doubt about that. And I think if people are playing coy about that, that's not... Right. I mean, I think I, I, I've heard people say they don't care about money and they're entrepreneurs. And I guess my response as an investor is then why am I investing? Yeah. Because I'm not investing for m my health, I'm investing for return on my capital. Yeah. You know, when we put, when, you know, when, when we put, when we're an LP, we put money to Georgian partners. We want them to work with great entrepreneurs and it's totally interesting. We meet great people. but. We want them to have a great outcome because that's why we're putting in money. Right. Same thing with the other VC in Toronto. Same thing, you know, private equity is the same. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're more so investing in the business to generate a larger outcome, not necessarily in someone's just passion, where there's no clear... Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's right. Like, like, I mean, it, it, it. that's right. And, and, and it's, uh, you know, is the return gonna be there or not? I mean, look, typically, if you put in a dollar, in about five years, yeah. you need to see about $3. Right, that kind of thing on 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 an okay case. And what do you enjoy more, private or public investing? Like public, I mean, public markets. Oh, they're so different. I mean, for the public markets, I'll tell you what our strategy is. We buy ETFs that basically are pro we do buy individual stocks. Ones you really like, you know, like the Amazons and the Facebooks. And sure, I, oh, I'm overweighted those, but typically we buy ETFs that approximate the global economy. Okay. So we just buy them I since we're quite. Right. Yeah, I mean, look, you go to Vanguard and. And you, you could buy ETFs for two basis points, yeah. which is so cheap. So cheap. It's, it can, that is sometimes 50 to 100 times cheaper on fees than using a broker. So, and, and listen, the truth is, is that almost no broker, like nine out of 10, beats the market over say four or five years. Mm -hmm. So if you just buy ETFs that approximate the global economy and sit back and don't touch them, sit That's on your hands, do not look at it every day, do not touch it. Do not get involved. I mean, Richard and I are in our 40s, and, and when we made those ETF buys, minimum buy period for those ETFs, 10 years. Nice. Minimum buy period. I'll call you in 10 years and tell you if we're up. We get the dividends, 
but we didn't invest in there because we're already, you know, to, you know, guess, you know, which part of the world is going to do better. I guarantee everybody watching this podcast in the next couple of years, there's going to be some kind of financial calamity of some kind. Why? Because every nine years there is one. We're at nine or ten years, Long three years. Cycle. Yeah, it's a bull cycle. Things things have to get flushed out. It's uh, you know this creative destruction in that. There's capitalism. This is how it works. There's going to be probably a credit problem, a China problem, a Russia problem, a high yield problem. There's all these. Yeah. yeah, there'll be a. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's, I'm not worried about the, what the Rumsfeld called the unknown unknowns, because I can't predict, you know, the true black swans, the ones you can't see coming, like, see yeah, like, I, I don't predict any kind of all-out wars. I think, though, there are a lot of, a lot of saber rattling in different places in the world. But I think that, um, look, money's been very cheap for a long period of time. Um, asset prices have gone up. Mm-hmm. And um, money now is getting more expensive. Uh, and the yield curve is flattening a bit. It could invert, which means that it's predicting the future is going to be worse, so it's going to be something a bit, bit tough. But um, listen, I think that uh, I think that people should step back and realize something that right now, as we're having this podcast, the Canadian economy is doing pretty good, mm-hmm. not super hot, but the American economy is doing amazing. Yeah, there would be creation of foreign capital as well. I mean, there's there's a lot of positives in uh, in the U.S. despite. Yeah, we have we have over full employment for the first time in 40 years, 3.9%. We have automotive sales on fire as an amazing. We have real estate doing really well, a lot of places in the U.S. It's struggling in some very high price places due to change in tax laws. But, um, you know, like if you went to Nashville or Dallas or Florida, I, you know, I'm telling you, it's uh, these. there's a lot of cities in America that literally cannot find workers for their jobs. There's more people right now, um, there's more job openings in America than there are people looking for work, which has not happened since 40 years. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of fake news, and the fake news is that the world's getting worse, look at this. Like, what's happening to us as investors and people, and this is really important when people are watching this, this podcast, is that we're being tricked, and the fake news is the world's getting worse. The world's getting dramatically better. Yeah. Like, let me ask you, like, think about this. Think about anybody watching this podcast right now. Let me ask any of you. Mm-hmm. Would you want health care from 2012? No. Would you want it from 2015? Would you want healthcare from even 2017? You wouldn't. There's not a time before today that you'd want the healthcare system. Mm-hmm. You want it tomorrow. You don't want even born today. You want to be born tomorrow. I mean, there is no war in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the economies are doing amazing. Um, people are living longer than they ever had. Child mortality is down to the lowest amount. Um, your ability to access capital is huge. I mean, there's so much technology, so much coming in. The world is becoming cheaper, faster, better. The trajectory that our planet's on right now, there won't be any extreme poverty on our planet by 2035. That's an amazing thing. I mean, Africa is rising. Latin America is rising. And there's so much untapped potential, too. I mean, when you just kind of sit and consider this sort of scenario, everybody talks about Bitcoin, blockchain, right, crypto. Mm -hmm. I mean... There's like literally a third or two thirds of the world that, that's still not even fully developed on e-commerce, as an example. Like there's still so yeah. Much I, l- l- listen, I, I, I to get on the cryptocurrency topic, I have spent a bunch of time there. I do own some cryptocurrencies. I think this is what's going to happen. I think that the the winner of cryptocurrency has not been born yet. I think that we're going through this epic washout, this nuclear winter right now of a lot of silly things. I'm glad there's 800 coins that don't make any sense that have gone away. Um, I think that Bitcoin and Ethereum are very interesting. Sure. I think Ethereum is probably the most interesting. It happens to be Canadian. It happens to be a lot of people programming on it. Smart contract, like the, the underlying principle. Yeah, it, 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 it's very clever. There's something going on there. If it's going to be the winner, I don't know. But I will tell you that the entire crypto universe right now is worth, as we're having this podcast, $250 billion. Mm-hmm. And if you had a bond fund on Wall Street that's $250 billion, you'd be big. You wouldn't be the biggest. You'd be moderately interesting. But if you take crypto right now and you try to liquidate it to U.S. dollars, my estimation is you couldn't even get 25 billion because that's only an estimated value. So I'm not sure what's really underlying it right now. Um, for crypto to really disrupt the market, it has to have it has to serve a real Y function. It has to disrupt something. So the fears of disrupting Visa and Mastercard are not even close. You can't even do the transaction. The fears of disintermediating the banks are not happening because the banks are also getting in using the blockchain. I think the blockchain. Yeah, I think the blockchain is super interesting. But you know, IBM and the banks they're they're getting on this. They're not missing out. But cryptocurrency that sits on top of the blockchain, you could probably miss some of that because it's not quite clear why you need it. I see people having these, you know, Bitcoin credit cards and all this kind of stuff, but I'm like, but why do I need that? Yeah, that's right. You know, people try to use it to avoid taxes, but the laws are clear. If you're making gains, you're paying taxes. So you're just not telling the government about your gains. That, that's not legal. So, <laughs> so there's not, there's this kind of underlying decentralized against the bank world in that whole thing, but 
I still haven't found a real reason mm. for the classic cryptocurrencies out there. As an investment. Though. Yeah, I, I see there's a very interesting idea born right now, and I'm working with a company in Toronto called Polymath. There's this idea of security tokens, the idea that I could take a pool of art or patents or a building, yeah. and I could tokenize that physical asset, and then I could give you a token so your token would have an absolute underlying value. Yeah. So what I think could happen is cryptocurrency and the blockchain could serve as a, as a very interesting vehicle to give access to pools of value, of certain pools of value that you could never normally get hold of. So someone could have a building which is worth a lot of money, but you would never own part of that. But if you tokenize it, you could own part of it. Or if you, someone owned $100 million of paintings and tokenized those Picassos or those Van Goghs, everybody could own a bit of it and trade those tokens. I like that idea, I just don't get some of the other day. I don't know why yet I need Bitcoin, mm -hmm. well, um, even though I do own it. And the other thing too is, it's funny, I have a bit of skin in the game as well, and I always kind of like the metaphor, you know, being a fish that rides the wave versus the one that gets caught in it. But yeah. um, I kind of wanted to ask too, just on this, on the value bar, like what's the, what's the opportunity cost of, of using this right now? I'm finding too with a lot of wallets, it kind of defeats the, the, the original sort of primary definition of what crypto is mm. in the sense that it's supposed to be a decentralized function. Mm -hmm. But then when you put it into some sort of digital wallet, you're centralizing it again. And I think Vitalik spoke about this recently in an article. And that's why you see a lot of executives actually write out their, uh, their, their addresses, like their Bitcoin address, and they put it in a bank vault or something. I mean, you're still, I think on paper, it, the, the decentralized model kind of works in theory. But I, I have yet to see it also put in practice. In, uh, Look, for, for, for it to work, if you take a look at all businesses that have changed the way things are in our lives, like you take Uber for taxis or Airbnb for hotels and those evolutions, they come into a market that has a lot of transaction, a lot of money, a lot of us doing it, and they say, hey, I got a better, cheaper, faster way to do it. Yeah. PayPal now you can, is a great example. Yeah, PayPal is a great example. So they walk into a market and say, hey, would you like it cheaper, faster, and better? I mean, that's the American dream, right? They build a better red wagon and people say, you mean I just press a button, I can get Uber for cheap, I can get a car for cheaper, no hassle, I don't have to get my money out? You know, you did look at Uber, Uber in the beginning was, was me calling a taxi and I just didn't have to get out my money to pay, that was good. But when they went to Uber X and they allow cheaper than taxi rides from anybody and kind of democratize the actual dispatch, then it was like cheaper, faster, better, I'm in. So they completely transformed a, a transportation industry and got a lot of people on. But that's valuable because it was something that we needed. It's not like Bitcoin is coming in and replacing my credit card or it hasn't changed the way I do anything yet. It hasn't broken anything. It hasn't made anything in my life cheaper, faster, and better. It's a speculative investment so far. So I'm looking for someone to show me why still, why I need to own some of these, these assets, although I do own them because I guess I'm taking an asymmetrical bet in the future. Uh, with Ethereum and Bitcoin. But I, so I own Ethereum and Bitcoin and, and Polymath, which is a company I'm working with, but besides that, I find a lot of it a bit strange. How do you stay on top of things with, with new trends, especially with emerging technologies? I was kind of thinking about this as you were answering this question because... I, I don't know if I do. I, I, uh, I, I do my best. I mean, there's so much now, right? I, know, I mean, when, when you go to the Creative Destruction Lab, they've made it so you have swim lanes. You can now turn up this year to a space one, you can turn up to an artificial intelligence, a quantum computing. Like, so let's say I turn up to the space one and someone shows me something great about space. How do I know we need that? You know, if I couldn't speak to Chris Hatfield, who's part of it, like, I don't think I could tell. Like, somebody has this idea of using kind of a tug that moves a satellite from one orbit to another. I mean, to me, that sounds amazing, but how do I know if we need that? I think we do, but I don't know. So space is, by the way, becoming a lot, lot cheaper and costs are coming down a lot. There's a great... I think space is going to be the next frontier of making money. I think that's a very, yeah, I think space has a, a lot of amazing startups because the price of getting into space and getting into that, that market has come down dramatically. And I think it's going to continue to come down. So I think there's something there. I don't, I'm not sure what it is. No. So let's maybe just talk quickly about the, the, the personal side. And um, so for you now, like obviously you're doing so much like investing and mm -hmm. mentorship. Yeah. Um, who are you kind of outside of that, that hemisphere? Like what do you, any sports, like you travel a lot, what do you, what do you kind of do that, that kind of completes the? I'm, I'm, um, I'm very Joe regular, you know, like if you see me around Yorkville, I'm walking around probably in my jeans and my t-shirt and my ba my hat, usually my Georgian partner's hat because I like the color. So I just keep wearing that one hat. Support the swag. Yeah, I actually wear the swag of the companies I invest because I think it's a nice cotton, I wear it. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, you could see me, you know, just like 
Uh, you know, I do all my own grocery shopping. I like to cook. Like I'm very, very like the person I always was. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I go to the gym. I read uh, a lot. Uh, I Any listen books to right it. Now? Um, like, you know, I'm digesting a lot of articles right now. Okay. Um, but I, uh, I, I haven't uh, picked up anything. Oh well, okay. I just completed uh, uh, both books, uh, *Sapiens* and uh, oh, *Homo geez. Deus*. The second book, I just picked up. The, I just consumed the second book, which I like *Sapiens* better. Which Great I found, f- yeah, Harari is amazing. Yeah. So I really would recommend people take a look at *Sapiens*. It's, it's a little discomforting, though. Like when you kind of finish the book, at, at some points, it's kind of like makes you feel like everything is just a human creation. So you, you're kind of left to question what. Well, I think what he does is to say, look, we were we were pretty crazy in back in the day. If you what point he makes is that if you follow humans out of Africa, everywhere we went, we destroyed all fauna and all large game everywhere we went. We we're a pretty destructive species. We're not. We never really lived in harmony with nature and this whole idea. Yeah. I mean, now we've just become super destructive with the environment. The only reason we haven't wiped out the oceans is that we haven't been able to get there. Yeah. Totally, it's deep. <laughs> so we're working on it. Um, so yeah, it's a very interesting book. Any mentors? Um. You know, I have a, a bunch of people in business and law and business in different places I call and ask questions mm-hmm. and I hang out with and I talk about ideas, some really, really smart people. So I would say that I have kind of verticalized mentors. So yeah. I have someone I call on legal stuff, so that I call on marketing stuff. Yeah, so some. Some of this. Uh, Michael, I, I, I do want to ask you this, this last question. I think this is probably very important for everybody watching. But um, for someone, say, in their early, mid, late 20s, what's that one piece of advice that you'd give them? So the most important thing you can do now, if you're in your 20s, is go out there and fail. You must go out there and fail. You must try. You must go out there and drive that bus into the wall. It's your soul, right? Look, let's say you're 23 to 30 or whatever you are, and you want to start a business. You have no downside. The only downside you have is if you know you 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 don't try, and if you have a failure or a couple. I think you'd be so happy in your 30s and 40s and 50s that you failed and thought it wasn't for you. Mm. Like, you have no downside. You probably don't have a mortgage. You're probably not married. You probably don't have kids. But you probably will at some time. So when you're 23 or 26 or 28, go at her. Hard. Mm. The other thing I would say is if you're not going to start a company, you're going to work with companies and you're 25 or so, the next 10 years are vital. Because if you just meander around and change jobs every nine months with the same kind of mid-level manager title, in 10 years I'm going to meet you, I'm going to look at your resume and go, I don't know, you just kind of meandered for 10 years. You know, I, I was taking an Uber recently, and the, I always talk to the drivers, and this driver, I ask him, well, what do you do? He says, ah, oh, you know, I'm like 33, and I'm, you know, I'm going to take a break from working. I'm just going to do a bit of that and this and that, like very casually. And he said, what do you think? I said, I think you're stupid. I think you're wrong. I think that you have the next couple of years, seven years to make it. I mean, it's very, it gets, every decade gets a lot harder to make it. I mean, what we don't talk about is the difference between 20, 30, and 40 is that we're a little slower. We're a little more tired. I mean, yeah. you can't lift as many weights. You do get tired faster. And when you have all this energy, this, all this what they call piss and vinegar, go out there and do something in your 20s. Like Spend that 10 years appro- appropriately. Don't waste the time. And it would be amazing if you failed. Mm-hmm. You can't fail. And especially if you're a student or you're a startup entrepreneur, just reach out to anybody you want and say, hey, I just started a company. Or Reach out to anybody you want in Toronto or the Valley and just send them a quick email. Say, hey, I just started a company. I'm a student. I just want to talk to you about your journey. Yeah. And you know what? If they don't respond, make then, but yeah, make it about them. But yeah. if, and, and actually sit down and ask them about their journey and learn about them before you go, of course. But at the end of the day, you just reach out and ask people about their journey. People will do things for you if they like you. So just be open, be okay with failure, get out there and blow something up. But it's okay. I think in Canada, you know, we find, we take failure too hard. In America, it's like, in Canada, you fail. They somehow remember it for a long time. In America, you fail. It's like, oh, what are you doing now? I'm up to, you know what that Wolf of Wall Street yeah. guy? Yeah. The Wolf of, I mean, the guy, the guy goes to jail. Now he's coming back. Now he's a oh, motivated he's speaker. He's made it look like he's the, the guy. What he's amazing at is to make it look like he's been an extreme success all this time. Yeah. When actually it's, it was quite the opposite. But I got to tell you, I give the guy kudos for for being able to make it so that everybody thinks that he's really, really the the thing. Mm. And and good for him. 
um, because uh, you know sometimes marketing goes a long way in these situations. <laughs> you can yourself. Yeah, you can rebrand yourself, but get out there and fail, innovate, try, pivot, hire people better than you, ask questions, don't try to answer things so quickly. Uh, your job as a CEO is two things, ask why and have uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. You should get out every day and just have uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. That's really it. comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Yeah, it's just, you live your life being uncomfortable. Maybe you can't make rent, maybe you can't make payroll, maybe you don't do this, maybe someone's not gonna buy your product. That, that, there's a discomfort, that's why most people shouldn't be entrepreneurs, because there's a high level of discomfort of not knowing where your next meal is gonna come from. Yeah. And some people are really good at it, but some people should not do it. Maybe, maybe one in 20 people should start a company, maybe less. I think there's this idea that it, it, since it's cheaper and faster and easier to start a company today than any time else, because all you need is a phone and a laptop, because you got cloud computing, you got everything at your fingertips, you go work at Starbucks, everybody should do it. I don't think so. I think it takes a very certain grit and a mindset, and, and I think that most people aren't set up for it. You know, I think it's a, I think it's a very challenging thing. You know, you got to know: Are you the captain or the lieutenant? And there's nothing wrong with being a lieutenant in a lot of companies. Yeah. Well, and Gary B talks about this too. Like the number ten at Facebook is still a multi-millionaire. So. The number hundred person <laughs> at Facebook, they made I, you know so many. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with being on a in a ticket like Shopify or Facebook. There's nothing wrong with being on that ticket. That's yeah. great. I think if someone came to me and said they want to start a coffee stop shop, I'd be supportive. And everybody thinks I'm going to say, "How many can you open?" But the short answer is, you can open one and you can open a hundred. I, I don't. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And and and, and like I I will work with the entrepreneur based on what they want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no right answer to how many coffee shops you open, or well, there's nothing wrong with having ten employees and never hiring anybody more. And just there's nothing wrong with having a small software company, having 10 employees, not taking on much cash, making a great living, making a couple hundred thousand a year and being happy. And living on your own. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with making a profit and growing a little slower and then just you know, owning your company and taking on a bit of debt. You don't need to raise 10 million and have 50 people. And I think if you want it for the cocktail parties in the summer on the rooftops, that's okay. Mm. But I'd rather at the end of the day be on the, in the party that's like I own my company or most of it and I make decisions and we're profitable and we're not worried about where the next paycheck's gonna come from. I, I'm a little bit slower and more uh, old school about how you build a company. No. And I also don't think you need to build a tech company. You can build a lot of different companies and that's do right. well. That, that's the main one too. Everybody thinks like, oh, startup immediately is referring to tech. But right. You're you you can take technology and have a startup and make it very efficient. You have a tech enabled startup and do just fine. That's right. I think there's this, and I also think there's a tremendous pressure as a young person that you have to start a company and you've got to start a company, be successful, raise a million. be a raise a, ten million and be a White House intern and you know an article for the <laughs> Supreme Court and start your own philanthropy, have a foundation, get a house with all your friends and slide off the rooftop into the pool. And there's just all this pressure to do all these things when I think it's all baloney. Mm -hmm. I think you should do one thing well, don't listen to anybody else, just focus on your one thing. And, and, and go out there and fail and you'll be fine. You don't need to do all those things. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have, look at this great idea here and then have, say look at all my other new great ideas. Like, just do one thing well. Good entrepreneurs spend all their time turning down opportunities. Mm. You know, good entrepreneurs don't, don't take on opportunities. They know that the opportunity they're on is gonna do better than all those small opportunities that they're not, right? You'll make money out of the other things, just not enough. You, you will make most amount of money doing one thing well. Right. So go out there and fail, do one thing well, stay focused, and it's okay if it doesn't work, and it's okay if you go back to being an employee. There's nothing wrong with it. Love it. Michael, thanks so much, man. Cheers. I appreciate it. Yep. Uh, episode 27, let's grab coffee, and hope you enjoy this podcast. Share it, like it, comment. Josh, thanks again for doing this video. Um, subscribe. Thanks, guys. <laughs>